last part of my interest, which is around coupled social hydrological modeling, which is a lot like myself, is where you bring social sciences and physical sciences together uh, and see what you have, you know, you find out. So, um, so yeah, I do have a background in uh, psychology as well, as well as a background in engineering. So I've been sort of straddling that world between social sciences and physical sciences for quite a long time. So the story I want to share today is a story that starts in the Okanagan. Um, has anybody been out to the Okanagan? All right, so a few people can testify that this region is you know, quite beautiful, it's quite startling. There's wonderful vistas of, of vineyards, there's vistas of agricultural fields. You can find apples and cherries. It's, you know, it's quite beautiful, lots of recreation. Um, just for a bit of a, oh, so a bit of a reference, that's some photos of the Okanagan Lake. And some of the photos that I'm going to share today are all from a study that I, I conducted between 2012 and 2016. So before I get into too much about the Okanagan, I wanted to share a little bit of my world. So I'm an environmental modeler, which means I love to model, I like to build models. And so I live within sort of a world called, you know, the water management modeling world. So what are, you know, what are models, what are water management models? Um, have you worked with models at all? Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we use them a lot uh, in many different ways. The, one of the ways that I use water management models is you know, by putting together sort of a physical construct of a watershed, looking at the, the, the rules and, and um, abstracts and structures that govern these conditions. And you know, we might use them to look at ice movement. I look at a lot of it, water supply and demand predictions, um, look at climate adaptation measures, how you know, and what would happen. So I personally really enjoy working with models they are very good, but there is a bit of a deficiency with the way that we put together our models and, and look at that. So I'll share what that is in a minute, but back to my story. So back to the Okanagan. So here's a little bit of a, of a map that shows where the Okanagan is. I am particularly was interested in working in the Okanagan Water Basin. So the Okanagan Basin is part of the larger uh, Thompson Columbia River Basin. It's sort of in the, the central south part of British Columbia. Um, it has one of the longest lakes in Canada. But the Okanagan is also one of the most arid regions in Canada. In fact, depending on the year, it is the most arid region, meaning it has the, the least amount of precipitation of any other place in Canada during the year. In terms of access to water, it also has the lowest quantity of water that's available for the people that live there. So in Canada, it's sort of the scarce region of Canada. So a little bit about it, um, the amount of annual precipitation you might find across this. And the, you know, in the north, it rains only about 250 millimeters a year, so only about 10 inches a year as compared to Vancouver, which I think we got that last night. So the, you know, which rains about 1,700 to 2,000 millimeters a year just in terms of comparison. The, the south is a little, bit, uh, a little bit better, a little bit more rain in the south. So which means that water in the Okanagan they rely upon the winter snowfall, the snowpack that accumulates in the winter. So a little bit else about the Okanagan is for most of the year, they use about the same amount of water as anyone else does around Canada, about 300 to you know, 320 liters per person per day. But during that summer, there, that Okanagan summer average jumps up to almost 1,000 liters per person per day. And there's a very significant reason for that. And the reason that is, is that all that wonderful agriculture you might see when you visit the Okanagan. And so um, that, that top of the top there, you may be wondering why, you know, if I had mentioned that the Okanagan uses about the same as everybody else, well, when you take that summer average and you average it across the whole year, it looks as though the Okanagan is this really thirsty water consuming area, but it's really that summer region that kind of puts, puts it into perspective. So, <clears throat> With this issue, you know, is there a water crisis in the Okanagan? And, you know, maybe, maybe not. But the Okanagan does have a lot of precipitation swings, a lot of patterns of swings. Um, you know, so really despite some recent flooding that has occurred the last couple of years, you may have seen in the news of, you know, Kelowna being flooded, a number of different areas uh, receiving quite a lot of rainfall and snow melt during that spring period. Uh, if we were to sort of look at the future of water in the Okanagan, um, and a researcher here at UBC, Stuart Cohen, you may uh, know him. 
led a little project back in 2010 that looked at this issue of water in the Okanagan in the future. You know, what, how did, what did climate mean, uh, climate change mean for the Okanagan? You know, what looking at population? And what he found was by 2040, the Okanagan needs about 20 to almost 50% more water. And currently, right now, they're already constrained. So this information was startling for water managers in that region, you know, seeing that the climate could change uh, to such a significant degree that it puts you know, all this pressure on managing water in the future. So like, like me and many other you know, water modelers, one of the first approaches, well, let's build a model of the situation. Let's take a look at what's the hydrology. Let's take a look at what's the precipitation patterns. Let's see what happens and let's get a better representation of really what is occurring in the Okanagan so that we can help to manage that risk. So uh, a number of different models were put together starting in 2009. This Okanagan Water Supply and Demand Project was initiated by the Okanagan Basin Water Board and a number of other uh, organizations in the Okanagan. They developed their first water county model in 2010. In 2012, they moved forward and then tried to connect all the hydrology together between the various different water districts and irrigation districts. And the idea was to really look at this impact of climate change and development to model the estimates of water use so they can develop policies that would help them to manage this. So these are good, but one of the questions that I came to them and said, you know, what happens after you put the policies in place? All these models look good, they use historical data, but you're, you're, you're really interested in changing those policies, you're interested in introducing things that have never happened in the Okanagan. How is your model going to respond to that? You know, will they be effective in managing water demand and will they be effective in managing that risk? So, <clears throat> one of the things when faced with this sort of question of what do we do in the future? Um, as a water model, one of the things I might do is put in what I call the assumption slider. You know, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but we want to model it, so we'll put a parameter in the model and then we'll attach it to some slider and say, well, what, what if we put in conservation? You know, 20%. What happens to the hydrology? What if, you know, there actually was 33% conservation? Slide it up a little bit more, you know, and, and manage the response of that. This works really well to help try at least get some estimates, some sort of behavioral response, but it's an assumption, right? It's something the modelers come to be. Often we may look at what happens someplace else and assume that's going to happen in the particular local region, which has a lot of deficiencies in that approach. So, in a and a, a conference of the Canadian Water Resource Association. I connected with Anna Warwick Sears of the Okanagan Basin Water Board, the executive director, and I started chatting with her about this effort that she was um, leading in the Okanagan. And you know, I said, "Well, you're putting together these models. You know, a lot of these questions are going to come come to come to bear. So, is there an opportunity?" to you know, improve the behavioral realism of these models by looking at human behavior and bringing that behavior to the model. So the first question, you said, well, how do we do this? You know, how do we make models more behaviorally realistic? Well, one thing you can do is you can develop um, models of agent behavior using previous data. So we say, well, we, you know, we can develop what people do and assume they're going to do it in the future. We can look at um, <coughs> you know, hedonic models whole bunch of different types of models. Um, but one of the simplest ways really to do this is to go out and actually ask water users how they would respond if you gave them various different policies. So how can we do that? You know, how can you go out and just ask someone, what, what are you going to do tomorrow? What are you going to do tomorrow? And then I have to believe you that you're actually going to do what you say you're going to do, right? Well, one of the ways that we can sort of believe that people are going to do what they say is if they're acting rationally, they'll make rational decisions. So one of the, the tools that I looked at in this um, study and this project with the Okanagan Basin Water Board was using choice analysis. And choice analysis is grounded on Lancaster's theory of utility and rational decision making. And so we can, we can assume some various sort of core aspects about people that make them make rational choices. The first is we all have preferences. You know, we like what we like. We, we assign value to what we like. And we're really good at ordering that value. You know, so we go to a store, we like certain features, we'll put a value on that and we'll make those decisions. 
If we weren't able to do that, it would be impossible for us to really go out and shop or, or make just choices because we're never knowing what decision might be better for us individually without. And so we try to act to maximize the utility or the value that we get in the decisions that we make. And so a real simple example of this is anybody drink coffee? I saw the coffee machine, you know, upstairs. <coughs> so you might say that we have this amount of coffee down below and then we have this utility that we get from the amount of coffee that we consume. So if we, you know, if we have a little bit of coffee, like, oh, that was really good, I feel a little better. We have a little bit more coffee, I'm getting, you know, much greater value in my utility. And, and then I had too much coffee, you know, all of a sudden my utility has declined. So utility isn't a function of linear response where you always get more value out of something, you can actually have a nonlinear response. But we're able to sort of put a preference on that and a value on that. And the way you do that is the only formula I'm going to show. I know you don't want to have your own classes and other formulas to go through, but I'll just sort of walk through this one. So under random utility theory, we can assume that an individual, being yourself, selects the, the choice that combines all the value they get from the way that you describe that choice. So all the different, uh, the compound utility of the alternative. So all, everything you put together, you go out and buy a car, everything that makes up that car is as a compound how much is valuable to you. And then we can break apart those features of it and actually say, well, the, you know, the probability of choosing that choice J is its ratio to all the value you get from all those different attributes. Okay. So, with that little bit of a background, go back to my story here. The first is, in the Okanagan, we really want to look at you know, some key water users. So this is a graph of how water use is split up in the Okanagan. And you can probably see by the pie chart, there's really two water users that you know, represent a significant portion of water use in the Okanagan. The first is agriculture, which uses about 55% of the water from the Okanagan. But residential outdoor uses quite a significant portion as much as well. In 2010, it was almost 25% of all the water in the Okanagan was used for outdoor irrigation. And that picture looks to continue to increase. So as more and more people move to the Okanagan, more houses are built, more lawns are put into those houses, that outdoor irrigation will continue to increase. So that was an area of interest for us to look at. The other one is agriculture, key, key industry, you know, key water use, as well as had some very key interactions with how people perceived, you know, farmers and their interaction with water management. So this is just um, <coughs> something that was shared during our stakeholder interviews and really working together the thing is, you know, farmers were very concerned that the water managers in the region really didn't have an interest in working with them. And in fact, maybe they didn't even want to stay as farmers, right? No one really cares about them. No one wants them to be there, right? There, this conflict. So we wanted to work with farmers and try and change them and say, no, you're actually part of the situation or part of the management question. Okay. <clears throat> so let's turn to that first question, those, those lawns, that 25%. So when an individual, uh, and this is sort of a snapshot of what an individual considers when they're thinking about their lawn. Anybody have a lawn? So maybe this might be a bit gray for you, but in, in Kelowna, there's a lot of individuals that have quite a few lawns. I think there's 27,000 lawns that are in, you know, in the city of Kelowna itself. So, you know, you might look at lawn. What do I like about it? Well, I like the, you know, type of turf it is. Is it bluegrass, Kentucky, uh, Kentucky bluegrass? Is it artificial? Uh, you know, how much does it cost to water the grass? What about, you know, how does it look in the summer? You know, is it brown and gray like Vancouver? Or is it actually green, you know, plush? Um, you know, what, how much does it make up my landscape? Is my whole landscape just a lawn or is it just part of my lawn, right? And so these are some of the, the features that, that we added and we thought were really important to that decision about what an individual might make in terms of the way that their landscape looks in terms of lawn. Okay. And the reason we wanted to understand those features is because we wanted to know why residents made a particular choice to have a lawn that looked like lawn A a lawn looks like lawn B, or a lawn that looks like lawn C. So these lawns were all in the same neighborhood. You know, within just a few blocks of me driving around taking photos, nobody called the paparazzi police on me or anything like that. But, you know, I wanted to really get some snapshots of what was happening. And the reason we want to understand those preferences, because each one of these lawns results in a different amount of water use. And that water use is important if we're trying to bring that into an, a hydrological model. Okay. So how do, how do you go about collecting this information? Well, 
you start with a survey. So choice experiments are typically conducted through a survey, through a, a quantitative survey. Lots of good survey. I'm not going to go into detail of the survey, um, but it, you know, it was an online survey. And so this survey was distributed in conjunction or collaboration with the city of Kelowna, the Southeast Irrigation District, Southeast Kelowna Irrigation District, the Okanagan Basin Water Board, the partnerships really pushed out messages that says it was important to take the survey. And so what we found, we, we received about 897 completed surveys throughout uh, the Kelowna uh, water area, water management area. Uh, how that breaks out, you know, about 66% represented people that were in the city of Kelowna and about 31% were in the Southeast Kelowna Irrigation District. And so if I map those, you know, it was a random distribution and we got back a random response. So it looked really good. You know, we have a good sampling of residents that are in, in that region so we can ask them questions. And one of the questions we asked them was, imagine that you had the choice to change your lawn. You know, so we're assuming that you know they have this choice. And so what we give in this is an example of a choice experiment. Anybody ever seen a choice experiment before? Few people, okay. For, I do walk through this real quickly. So this is a, a simple choice experiment. An individual who takes the survey would see six different samples of different choices that are put together. So they don't, they don't just see one, they see six different ones. And during this, the, the study will, will show them these are the lawn features. They'll give them differing sizes of lawn. They'll, they'll give them different ways the lawn is maybe constructed, water conserving varieties, bluegrass. Um, they'll tell them what the appearance may look like during the summer. We offered them a small incentive to change their lawn, and I'll come back to that incentive. And then we tell them what's the cost of watering that lawn. We also um, manipulated that price a little bit by making the price more expensive up and down, you know, to see if that how sensitive that price was. So, so then <coughs> the water pricing and estimates were based upon their current lawn and the choices that they had available to them. And I'll come back to that just real quick. But then it's, simple, it's a simple choice. After they look at these three options, they just choose A, B, or C. Do they like the new lawns or do they like their current lawn? So in the survey early on, we wanted to make it as this, this choice as realistic to them then and then other, the other ones. So we actually went out and asked them what type of house they had, how big was their house, what kind of lawn they had, what did it look like during the summer, so that we can put together a picture that says, here's what you currently have. So you can choose what you currently have if you want to continue. But what did you use to generate the numbers in there? Because I'm trying to see if there's any relationship between the numbers, so I can have to see. Oh, for sure. Um, well, I'll go, go right here and maybe this will help you a little bit. So the, the choices of traditional uh, variety of lawns or water conserving variety lawns, artificial lawns, that was a, a three choice that we gave them. Um, the, the, the appearance of their lawn varied between either being mostly brown all the way to being mostly green. Um, the incentive they gave them was based upon some information that the city of Kelowna, the, how much the city of Kelowna was actually willing to pay for someone to switch their lawn and that varied between zero and five hundred dollars. And this information in terms of the amount of water used and the price that it would, would base was based upon um, the property size that they said their, how much their, how large their property was based upon the turf that's being used. So traditional uses more water than water conserving and artificial uses no water. Um, how much water it needed to maintain their appearance and then watering between April and October would gave me the water use and based upon that water use that they would need to maintain this lawn presented, uh, that was all based upon the indoor and outdoor water rates that were in Kelowna at that time. So we used real information and brought that back to them. Maybe you can ask a follow-up question? Okay. Yeah. So after the survey was completed, uh, using a tool called Latent Goal, we did some uh, built a uh, multinomial logit model I only wanted to show you this to essentially highlight what do we see from this type of model. Primarily what you can see is a coefficient of the, of the multinomial logit and what you're looking for is a relationship between you know, negative and positive. So if there's a negative value that shows there's a negative preference for that level. If there's a positive value that means there's a positive preference for that value. So what we found was in, the, in Kelowna there were some you know, dislikes for small and very large lawns. 
You're right. So they, they really expressed that these large lawns that come with development, they did not have a preference for this. In fact, they preferred to have different sizes that were available to them. Another one was the incentives that the city of Kelowna would be willing to pay. There was, they were not significant in, in influencing how people made decisions. They just, at that level, it wasn't worth them to make a decision. So either the city needed to go back and offer more money or that would not be a, a possible policy for them. Some other quick things. Um, watering cost was important, so there was a positive uh, relationship, meaning that you know, uh, the, you know, the greater the cost, the less likely they would choose that lawn. 50% uh, turf was acceptable for most residents. They really liked that aspect. Um, we also looked at you know, what the current lawn uh, conditions were, so residents that had this 75% turf you know, could, took up a, more, a large portion of their lawn, they were more likely and more willing to switch to smaller turfs versus the ones that had the small size already, they didn't really want to switch to anything, which makes sense. They already sort of have this ideal lawn they have, right? And so this idea was all sort of worked around the you know, notion that there definitely is not a possibility of lawns changing or changing lawns in an area, provided that there can be some support because there's still concerns about they, they have the time and, you know, and the capacity to make that change. But we also just sort of tested that with some other questions. Uh, one thing we found was going into the study, there was a lot of people who were saying nobody wanted to make changes in these lawns. But in fact, that we found that only about 10% of the population felt that you know, their neighbors would find it disturbing, that there really wasn't this, this barrier for possibly changing their landscapes. Um, second, there was, there was a strong uh, indication that individuals, you know, if they were gonna cut back on water, they really wanted to cut back on that lawn watering. That's the area they would wish they saved. And, you know, for, for information for the Okanagan Basin Water Board, they really had no interest in cutting back on showers or doing things different that we're often asked to do, right? And so they say, well, if you're going to ask me to save water, can I just save it outdoors? Stop making me take shorter showers. Um, all as long as their lawns could stay, you know, stay green. So there was still a lot of preference. They liked their green lawns in the Okanagan. Okay. So just some quick uh, highlights from this study going to the City of Cologne, the Okanagan Basin Water Board. One is that you know these preferences for lawn attributes, um, they can, they're being sent directly. I haven't even gone into the modeling side, but just the preference, knowing about what consumers uh, desire or prefer, was definitely uh, some, led to some policy action, including developing new landscaping guidelines for the city of Kelowna, because they're obviously an area there. The, the preferences for smaller proportions of lawn, um, that now it shows that lawns can be a reasonable target for water conservation. Um, you know, the idea that if they could provide enough incentives, more than the $250, $500 that is available, that these large lawns may actually want to switch to something smaller. Um, and last, you know, it's the idea that if we could provide more information to these homeowners, they could make decisions that they would switch. Okay. So next I wanted to chat about agriculture. So in agriculture, um, one of the first things we found out, it's very, very challenging to put a single decision in front of a farmer. You know, because every farm is made up of a very diverse environment. One farm may have apples, may have pears, may have cherries, you know, may have some uh, grasses are growing. And so you can't, you know, it was challenging for us to just ask a single question in a survey. So we took a different approach for farmers. And we said, well, you know, whenever there's enough water in the Okanagan, the conflict, there's not really a lot of conflict. And so farmers can grow their crops. They can, you know, um, there's no conflict between drinking water and, and water for agriculture. But it's during those conflicts that there's really a particular issue. So how can farmers participate in helping manage water during water shortages? And so this is the question that we posed for them. They said, well, what could you do during a drought, right? What are your concerns during drought? And so a lot of, you know, uh, things that go through their mind are, you know, do I have water rights during drought? How much does it cost to water? You know, do I need, do I need the water? How is it available? What types of crops can I grow during drought? Um, is there, what's the risk of drought? Um, can I do something else with my water? As well as, you know, what's the overall ecology of the relationship with stream health during that area? So we presented a question to farmers that, you know, we wanted them to be part of planning, you know, for drought management into the future. You know, you are now part of the region. And so we highlighted real quickly to them that imagine, this was during 2000, early, mid-2013, so it was before the Water Sustainability Act was finished. So we said to the farmers in the Okanagan, I said, imagine that, you know, the province, which they are, is providing more flexibility to develop their own drought plans. 
for times when water concerns are no longer, or water is no longer being met. So imagine that period of area. So key for farmers was that they were working together as a group of farmers. They wanted to know that they came together to work on this. And so they had this time of shorty, so we had this water, normally you had water availability during summer, but now you have this water shorty, so you have only this amount of water. There's a number of things that you can do to respond to that. For instance, you can allocate water to differ you can differently. Um, you can make everybody reduce water, mandated water reductions. Um, you could trade water, you know, and then what does that all impact? How does it impact the water stream health? And at the end, the idea is you put together a plan that adjusts the summer use for that, for that period of shortage. So <clears throat> like, uh, like the residents presented a, a, a choice model, a little bit simpler choice model. They were just to pick between two plans. Um, but the one thing was key to take them out of their current state is that water licensing, standard water licensing would not apply during a drought situation, right? Because whenever normal water licensing is um, just quickly in British Columbia, water licensing is based upon uh, first in time, first in use. So if you're the first person to request water on a stream, you have the priority over somebody who requested that water later on. So during a conflict without any sort of plan, you know, license number one gets the water, license number two goes down until you run out of water. And so we said, let's do away with that and think of something new. Okay, so farmers were presented a number of different options. Um, same thing, the varying percentages of water use reduction from zero to 30%, uh, three different types of allocation, uh, proportional distribution, crop value, uh, and representative um, allocation. You can have different opportunities to trade water no trading, you could trade between everyone, meaning you know commercial, or you could only trade between farmers. And then last, we gave them an indication of what that plan would mean for the stream health. You know, would, would there be a high impact or low impact um, on that? And so, same thing, they go through, evaluate this, they choose their, the one they would prefer. Um, and so, sent this survey broadly out across the Okanagan, received some uh, outside the Okanagan that we did not include in the analysis, but we had a good response. Almost 194 farmers you know, completed this experiment, which is very challenging to get farmers to engage. And so we thought maybe that was quite successful. Um, represented close to uh, low 1,500 acres of land. Did a number of different strategies. So if anybody wants to talk to me about sampling strategies, I had a lot of fun with Google Maps and actually just tapping on a farm. This is a farm, yep, that's a farm, yep, that's a farm. Because the Ministry of Agriculture won't give you a list of farms. Right. Well, they'll give you a list of farms, but then they don't tell you you can't do anything with the list of farms. So you have to go make your own list of farms. But I have a list of farms in the Okanagan if anybody wants to know. Okay, so what did we find with farmers? First, we found um, some very interesting preferences that con you know, were contrary to the perceptions of water managers in the region, and even farming groups went in the region. So again, the idea of if you have a negative utility, you're indicating that there's a negative preference for this. It's not as preferred as the positive utilities. Um, so in mandated reductions, uh, individuals were, the farmers as a group were saying, you know, we actually like, you know, some mandated reductions during a drought, you know, around 15%. But they had, a, they had more preference for that than having no mandated reduction at all. The second was around allocation priorities. So, um, so here we did proportional distribution, crop value, and the last one was sensitivity of crop to water loss. So if, you're, if your farm you know, would, uh, for instance, you had orchard, you can't go without water. But if you have annuals, you might be able to go without water. So here, the farmers expressed that they would prefer proportional distribution, meaning you know, sort of allocated to everyone, uh, or sensitivity to crop loss, but not crop value. And this was during a time where there were some changes to the agricultural land reserves in order to you know, take out those land that was producing non-high value crop, right? So the farmers themselves are saying, we don't want decisions made upon the value of our crops. We want other decisions being made. Um, the one that was really startling for everyone was trading. So um, everyone as a whole preferred opportunities for trading, either trading water between farmers, which was the most preferred, but even trading between all users was more preferred over not trading at all. So right now, you cannot trade water in British Columbia, but there is a whole sort of underground trading system going on in the Okanagan where farmers work together 
to try and you know work through a stream. And then last, which is just more of a check, but we, we showed that yes, you know, plans that had a low environmental impact were preferred over plans that a high environmental impact. So um, as m much of it, many individuals that live in British Columbia, there's a high you know, environmental attitude, so the farmers express that as well. Okay. So this was as a group. We also looked at how farmers changed between groups because and we found a few differences. But this is the kind of information, because you don't manage farmers in the Okanagan as a single group. So you often manage them based upon the crops that they grow. So we looked at what do farmers you know, perceive based on their crops. And we found that you know, there's definitely similar preferences for the allocation policies and stream health, but there was a few key differences between ranchers and vineyards. So vineyards are grape growers, um, wine producers. They were pretty much indifferent to watering restrictions, meaning that, yeah, 15%, 30%, 0%, it didn't really matter too much to them in their decision of their plan you know, um, for that. And there's some you know, ecological reasons for that. You know, vineyards are some of the lowest water use crops in the Okanagan, so they already have sort of a, uh, they're already using less than their allocation, so there may have been some um, ability for, farm, for vineyards to actually take that, that mandated reduction without any issues. But <coughs> vineyards were less likely to prefer trading between farmers versus all users. So vineyards wanted to, to trade water with someone else besides farmers. We didn't follow up on that one, but that was just an interesting. Ranchers were less likely to agree with mandatory re re restrictions, and forage crops were less likely to want water trading. So just some little differences we found. This is all information that goes right back to the Ministry of Agriculture and the Okanagan Basin Water Board and Irrigation Districts so that they can look and say, well, how you know, could we potentially put together a water sustainability plan, which has not yet been finalized uh, in the Water Sustainability Act, but there are now some new opportunities to work with groups to try and put together their own plan. Okay. One of the things uh, I'll just briefly touch on, because now I want to get into modeling, what does this really mean for water use? Well, one of the things we asked after we, we, we said, what's your preferred plan? Well, if you selected that plan and that plan was put in place, what would you do? You know, would you you know, trade water, would you reduce the amount of irrigated land that you use, would you trade, you know, your, uh, and convert your land to something else. And so what we found, you know, was uh, some actions that farmers would take with these different plan policies, right? So if there was no trading available, you know, what we see is that farmers aren't making too many decisions around investing crops, but when they actually had some trading opportunities, they would go forward, uh, invest in potentially converting their crops to lower, lower water requirements. Maybe potentially looking at that incentive that they could trade some of that water off into the future. So, still working on, on that one. Um, hope to have a paper out later, probably next year, that really highlights that action that farmers can take. So, just quickly, I'll summarize this, and I want to go to the last part of my talk. So farmers in the Okanagan, they're definitely willing, they showed expression and willing to, to collaborate, to consider drought responses. They're willing to consider mandated reductions in water. They're open to tr water trading. Um, and they also, a lot of these contrasted and conflicted with the statements that were put into the Water Sustainability Act. Okay. So now returning to this, this water cons conservation response slider, um, the, the information I got from landscapes and from farmers, I can turn into a behavioral model that would actually then tell me if I put in these plans or if I gave this incentive or if I offered the opportunity for lawn switch, switching lawns, I could get a real response to that. And so that's what I wanted to do with one of their Okanagan water basin models. And so this is just a quick highlight. Uh, of how you might do that, how you might conceptually take all this stated preference data that you collected, integrate it into a coupled model, bring in all the data from the lakes, reservoirs, and it really comes together. Um, no time to really cover this, but the idea is that rather than having separate models or data that's external, let's bring it all together into a single coupled model that responds. So in this model, we we looked at using the, what's called the water evaluation and planning model tool. It's a tool that's used by the Okanagan Basin Water Board. Uh, and we brought that behavioral data to their demand points that are in the model. And we said, well, let's apply these policies and look at how that demand changes. So in, in a choice experiment, 
you manipulate all those different levels and attributes that you saw, well, you can imagine you can put together 16,000 different ways of combinations that you possibly could look at things. So we said, rather than doing that, let's just look at the key ones, the ones that are really informative. Um, so we looked at three, three scenarios. The first is in the baseline, we do nothing. Uh, and here we want to look at just the lawns that are, that are like 50% size lawns and 75% size lawns. So we're just assuming that those are the residents uh, that, are, that are making the shift. And the preferred lawn, we propose an alternative that was based upon the utility coefficients that they told us. What were those preferences that they expressed? This is the preferred lawn that everyone would like, and that's a 50% turf. The grass is a water conserving variety. It's mostly green during the summer. Um, it, you know, we'll give them a $250 subsidy. It's a small amount, but that was the one that was, had some significance. And it costs about $90 a year to water. Um, the other uh, one was the extreme water conserving. So this proposes, let's push that as far as we can, where it's a 25% turf for the whole landscape, limits to just 25%. It's a water conserving variety. You push it to be most, more, ground than green, or more brown than green during the summer. And you, know, you, you give them a little bit less subsidy. Um, so really kind of pushing that extreme. Let's say what happens with that, right? So we have preferred and the extreme. And so what we found using just the market, uh, a, a market analysis using the, the probability, going back to that first, gra uh, first little equation I gave you, what's the probability of people switching based upon presenting this choice to them? And we found that you know, for the preferred lawn alternative, about 55% would switch you know, if they had 50, uh, uh, um, if their current status quo was about 50% of their, their landscape. And 77% would switch if, if it was about 75% you know, of their land. So we, you know, it's, a, it's a different shift. For the extreme water conserving, not as many people would switch. You know, it's not, it goes off of their preference. Um, but so we found about 41% would switch for that you know, 50 square, um, status quo of 50% of their, of their lawn, and then 65%, oh, about 65.7 would switch if they're around 75. And so this showed a bit of a graph of how we assume that adoption would occur over multiple years, following sort of an S-shaped growth adoption curve. But that, really what we wanted to see is, what does that mean for water use? So now we can see how people are making changes in their, their lawns, but ultimately it's the water use that is informative. Um, so we, once we got that adoption rate and those, those switching, th we had the landscape information in the model, we had the water use information in the model, so the model also calculated how much water is used by these different landscapes as they move and, and transition. And so, uh, so here's our baseline profile of, of this five-year period, you know, between the two, um, sort of, you know, they balance about the same as what they were, little fluctuations up and down. Um, if they were, you know, switch to that preferred lawn of 50%, you know, they would save a little bit of water. Um, their preferred lawn for the 75, going from 75 to 50%, you save a little bit more water because you're actually reducing the size of your lawn versus the, those that had already at 50%. They're just saving water through changing the turf type. Um, but then on the extreme conserving, you know, even though there's a lower adoption rate for pushing people to this extreme, water conservation type lawn, uh, it saves the most amount of water. And so that was trying to bring out the fact that you can't just always measure the impact of policies based upon the adoption or how many people are going to follow it, but you need to understand really what's that connection between that. Oh yeah, these are in uh, cubic meters. So this would be cubic meters. This was only for a single data point I'm showing. So, for, so single family outdoor water demand in the city of Kelowna. This is how many cubic meters are being used. Um, and then this is a graph of essentially the different profiles of the residents when under these different scenarios. Oh, you know, I think that that's actually date. Sorry, I didn't notice that when I pasted it this morning. That should be a date. So it's an Excel date code, <laughs> but that, that is 2010 to 2016. So how does it go 417 and then 416? No, that is, uh, no, see if you can see it's increasing, 40, 45, 43, 49, 08, 41. It's 41639 yeah. Yeah, so well, I didn't notice that, I apologize. That's, that's actually it's just a date code. I, some people are smiling because they've probably seen that happen in Excel. But, uh, that should just be dates. So 
so the last thing we did with with this disinformation, this model, is to actually apply it in practice. So in the Okanagan, brought this model, brought these preferences, brought together a group of water managers um, representing a variety of different organizations in the Okanagan, um, including you know, Agri-Food Canada, the Regional District of Okanagan, Sanilkameen, City of Kelowna, there's various different partners. And so let's go through and, and work with this model through a different couple of scenarios and see how this information, or what this model would, would how, what kind of information that would this model provide. Here's just a bit of a uh, snapshot of the different types of things that were, were looked at. So, you know, we had a wa targeted water reduction program from the city of Kelowna. Um, we looked at what would happen, you know, if the farm, if there was farm expansion in by the Southeast Kelowna Irrigation District, what would that mean for, for water use and how would, you know, how would they manage drought there? Um, we looked at whether, you know, efficiency reduction of future water needs. So we're looking to see, you know, let's imagine farmers uh, put in efficient irrigation. So different types of things, trying to just explore those, uh, those policy options to try and meet that need for 20 to 50 percent water in the future. Okay. So there was a few sort of take home points um, that came out of this workshop as well as, as really throughout these multiple years of doing this type of work. And the first is the going into the study, meeting with all the think, city of Kelowna um, water managers, the Okanagan Basin Water Board. The first was this perception that residents were really resistant to you know, landscape rest restrictions. Nobody wanted to touch lawns in the city of Kelowna. Nobody even wanted to have a conversation about this because residents were felt that, you know, they felt that residents really wanted their lawns. So after doing this, we show that, well, actually residents had shown some preferences for smaller lawns. And so there is a potential to have that conversation with residents in the Okanagan. Um, the second around lawns is that all residents, they like lawns and they like really big green lawns. Uh, and what we found was in fact, no, residents are willing to accept less green lawns. You know, so that perception that had maybe persisted over many years um, is no longer potentially true. Um, another one was that, you know, neighbor lawn perceptions, you know, what does it mean for your neighbors? Like your neighbors make me have a really green lawn. That was some of the thoughts that were shared. Uh, but in fact, we found that, nope, cost is actually more important for, you know, for individuals, residents making their choice on the lawns they have than just the perceptions of their neighbors. Neighborhood perception is important. Then not only say it's, uh, it's not, but this, this idea of how much does it actually cost, you know, to water these lawns was very important. Um, the second, uh, the fourth thing going into this is we assumed following the 2008 uh, sort of uh, water, uh, the name drops all of a sudden, but um, Gordon Campbell's water, water action plan put in a, basically an, an, a, a goal in this plan that all new water need in British Columbia would be met through efficiencies, meaning that we had to meet about 33% improvement in water efficiencies in order to meet that. Um, we measure that, well, you know, at least in the Okanagan, based upon current perceptions and value, we only can really expect about 22%. You know, so if we're trying to, you know, there's still this question of supply and demand that, that needs to occur in the Okanagan. The fifth is, farm, you know, assumption that farmers would not participate in water markets. Big assumption. Like nobody, you can't even talk to farmers about trading. You can't talk to farmers about, uh, about you know, having a water market. Uh, and what we found is that no, farmers are actually very open to this opportunity to trade water. And including some farmers are open to the opportunity to trade water outside uh, the farming community. Uh, the last uh, two, six is farmers, they only make economic decisions. That was repeated over and over. Farmers only care about the, the it's an economic decision. I'm going to use water because it's an economic decision. But we found that, that the decision of whether to use water and how to use water is, is wrapped around broader environmental concerns, you know, stream health concerns. And so it's not just about an economic concern for farmers. And last is that going into it, residents weren't really aware of their water use in the Okanagan. Nobody knew anything about water use in the Okanagan. And residents are still not aware of water use in the Okanagan. So even after the study, um, that's still a really big issue. Of, of managing water in the Okanagan is the residents have no idea. Some of the, this was the first time that water used or how much water their lawns, uh, excuse me, 
the, our study was one of the first times that that information was presented to residents in the Okanagan. And in fact, we had to change some of the data that we put in the place. So the way we presented the data, we presented it in cubic meters, which I don't really like cubic meters, cubic meter, thousand liters, everybody got a visual representation of a cubic meter, not really. But you know what a liter of water is, right? There's one up there in the desk. So when we presented to residents that they used 1.7 million liters of water to water their lawns in the summer, it was too unbelievable for residents. They said, I, I can't buy that. But in fact, that's actually what is happening. So we, we said, well, we need to give them a perception and way to change, so we converted it into their, what they see on their bill, which is cubic meters. So thank you. I just wanted to sort of give a shout out to everyone that was involved in this project. When you have so many different stakeholders and different groups you're working with, you need to have a lot of different partners with you. Uh, and this research definitely requires strong community partners across the Okanagan Basin Water Board, various different agricultural groups, uh, and funding from multiple, multiple places. So I'll turn to questions. Yeah, so the, the, the question was what was presented and were they given a cost for switching their lawns? And no, they were not given that cost for switching their lawns. And there were a number of different reasons why. In choice experiments, we try to make that decision really concise. And at that particular point, the decision was more about the water use. Um, and then bringing in the cost was very variable and was hard for us to present that to them. But obviously moving forward, you know, when you're making a decision of, of switching, additional costs come into play. And that was really what was influencing, was that subsidy enough? And it isn't enough for the Okanagan. If you give five, somebody $500, it's not going to be a key decision factor for them to make a, make a change. Yeah, so we met with the various different, uh, a couple different association groups um, out there in the Okanagan to, to ask that question actually, because, you know, are you forcing a decision? Or are you giving that decision voluntarily? So we chose to force that decision. And there's some implications on what that means. But if you notice on, the, on that policy, I did not give them into an option to say, I choose something else. Because we wanted to really say, well, yes, you are being forced. We are talking about new, 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 cho new choices. And so of these new choices, which ones would you prefer? Yeah. And so the way it was presented was, imagine you are working with a group of farmers to develop a, plan, a response plan. And during that response, the normal water allocation licensing would not apply. Yeah, so the question was, um, so the residents also expressed that they needed, um, or they didn't have enough time, or they didn't have the capacity to make that switch, and so did we bring that information back to the policy workshop? And not in that particular workshop, but work after that has now been looked at, how could the City of Kelowna or the Okanagan Basin Water Board provide assistance for residents that are wanting to make that switch? You know, so is, you know, um, beyond just the financial incentives and so perhaps maybe there's a collaboration with uh, a number of different contractors which would pull the grass out or and the other thing the Okanagan Basin Board is, is working on is presenting what that future looks like right so we were just looking at the lawn but what now they also need to present what goes in place of that lawn and so zero scaping option and different types of landscapes are being presented so that people can visualize that what would what would their landscape look like without lawns okay good questions Yes. Sure. Yes. And I do apologize about that. I. Yeah, I, I just. Yeah. 
Yeah. For sure, yes. So. Yeah. So, um, some more information on what I put into the model. So, we used a stochastic adoption model, which means that. So, this is for the whole city or is this for one household? No, no, sorry. This is for the whole city. So, this is the single family outdoor water demand points. Imagine you had a demand point in the model. So, this is up for the, for the city. And so we used what's a, a stochastic adoption profile that is uh, basically an S-curve adoption, but it also has a standard deviation of two. So you know you don't not everybody adopts perfectly. So that first sort of explains why you see this baseline. It's not it's not constant. People aren't constant. You're not going to have a standard baseline across uh, across you know for multiple years. So you may see different water use profiles going up and down around these baselines. The reason. Uh, to answer your first question, why is the water why is the water use so much lower for the moving between uh, your SQ15 and your SQ75? And that's because of the shifting of the lawns. So SQ75 represents an average house size. I think it was about 0.25 acres, covering that lawn with 75% of their landscape with with lawn, with the bluegrass Kentucky blue Kentucky blue grass. Um, and, this, and SQ50 is the same, same house, but now covered with only 50%. So when they're moving from this, this moving from the extreme water conserving profile, they were basically, those lawns were going from Kentucky bluegrass to water conserving varieties and using less water. And so they had some improvements, but on SQ75, those houses were actually pulling out 25% of their lawn going to the extreme water conserving. So there was much more water to be saved because they were making that actual size of their lawn, they're switching the size of their lawns. Yeah, so if I can just go back real quickly. Uh, so on these scenarios, the assumption is that people, where this is what's presented to people, this is the new lawn. And SQ75 is what the status quo is. So this graph is not moving to a 75 si a, a lawn that's 75. It's what happens if people who have lawns that are, represent 75% of their property switch to an extreme conserving profile. So this is that water savings. It is absolute water use, but you can see that it, it does represent water yeah. savings because. Yeah. So now these are individual scenario runs. So it's imagining that people who are, you know, that that represent their lawns 50% are moving to an extreme lawn that's 50%. What would happen in terms of the amount of water they save? So it's water saving or it's absolute water? It's absolute water use, but you can see it basically is representing water savings because there's a decline. So is, it, is, it, is the point that it's rooting the total amount of water Fifty percent, yes. So, so in reality, that, that theoretically, that, that curve that we see for the seventy-five would probably be shifted up because initially they would be more water than. Yeah, so everybody started with the same base profile, whatever the current outdoor water use in 2010 was, and then moving forward, yeah, basically. Right, so what I'm saying is, as far as understanding this in the real world, if you were to look at this curve, the curve for the state of 75 water system, like this kind of that curve, that would be shifted up because initially that household, in reality, not all the households are using that average. Right? Yes, exactly. So, so, so and those, those, whether you're starting with 75% or 50% is going to change where you're starting. Yeah, and that actually brings up a good point that I did not talk about with, which is this assumes some level of homogeneity or genus um, between everything, but in reality there's lots of different sizes of lawns that are in there. Um, and so this is just presenting what would happen if they all switched and what, you know, so they can get a, basically a representation. So it's less, you know, this information is less about the value of the number, but really what's the profile differences, right? What would actually happen? you know, in the water use or the pro water use profile with these different varying types of policies put in place. Moving forward, um, 
you know, once the city of Kelowna or the Okanagan Basin Water Board gets a better handle on what really is their lawn distribution, so that's something they don't know. And so then they could move and put in that actual picture of what are the current lawns in there and then rerun this and say, now we know exactly what our lawns are. So we no longer have to look at SQ50, SQ75. We just simply say, here's the new policy. What would this population do? Yes? Um, I'd like to follow up on Sean's last question about Yes. And that was the survey? Yeah, the survey number. That, yeah. So you had the 65 complete survey and 195 complete choice. Did we study those who didn't complete the choice? Only from their social dem demographic aspects, but we could not study them for the choice because they, they were not included in the choice experiment. So their preferences for, for water trading, for allocation, they did not tell us because they did not complete the choice experiment. So they, had, they, they got to that point and then they rejected the course? Uh, there was a number of different reasons why they didn't complete it. One, they were outside the study area, um, so they weren't offered it because we were only looking at the Okanagan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we didn't, yeah. They well no I guess what the, the answer is it we don't know if they refused to answer or whether they didn't they just didn't answer it because there wasn't a choice in there it says I re, like we didn't give them an option to say I refuse to take this part yeah but a good portion of them didn't complete the survey because they weren't in the study area and so when you distribute like when the like for instance the grape growers association distributed the survey out a number of their farmers came back, but they were outside the Okanagan, so they did not actually get the Okanagan study. So there was a question that was like, are you Yeah, one of the first areas, what's your, what's your uh, area? And then they, we sort of filtered those individuals out. Um, but some did not, some that were in the Okanagan did not complete it. You know, one of the most famous studies of uh, discounting, and how it's not really, um, the Memorial Copper Association, they did a study Really interested to study the results rather than the answers. It's kind of a rejection of the trade. Yes. I'm wondering if you contemplated Well, we did. There was an. Um, but we haven't, yeah. I guess we did, but we haven't looked at it more in depth, no. I might have one more follow up. Yeah. Did you find out how many of these people were long term, rather short, you know, recent residents? Yes. In your residential and your farming? Because I'm sure you're aware that early in the 2000s, there was metering and uh, uh, pricing of water in that region, which was novel to be seen anywhere else. Yes. So there's a good deal of resistance to the whole management of water there. And I'm wondering how much of the uh, promises that were made but not realized are influencing the answers you're getting today. Hmm. I can't answer that. It's a very good point, though. Well, there's a massive yeah. thesis that you have yeah. to be. Yeah. It'd be very interested in that. Yeah, I mean, that's so, the reason we forced their choice, and it makes sure it's the difference between forcing them to participate. Nobody was forced to participate. Um, so they were voluntarily you know, able to come on and stop the survey at any particular point. We just forced them to make a choice between these new policy plans, yeah. But, but yeah, in terms of that follow-up, no, I haven't looked at that. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.